Order! I call Secretary Matt Hancock to make a statement. Secretary of State for Health, Matt Hancock. Uh, Mr Speaker, with permission, I'd like to make a statement on coronavirus. We're nearing the end of such a tough year where the British people have united and had to make so many sacrifices for the common good. And I know the whole House and the whole country has been cheered by the progress that we've seen in the last few weeks, which means that we can now roll out the vaccine programme that will ultimately set us free, Mr Speaker. I can tell the House that today the NHS has begun its vaccination through GPs in England and in care homes in Scotland. And day by day, we're giving hope to more people and making this country safer. It's life-saving work. However, it will take time for its benefits to be felt far and wide. So we must persevere, because the virus remains just as dangerous as it has always been. The average daily hospital admissions are up 13%. The latest figures show that the average daily cases have risen by 14% in the last week. And as before, this rise and this spread is not even across the country. We're seeing a sharp rise in South Wales, in London, and parts of the east and southeast of England. This is a trend we're also seeing in other parts of Europe, in countries like Sweden, where nearly all the intensive care beds in Stockholm are currently in use, and Germany, where they've had to announce tougher new restrictions over the weekend, uh, and the Netherlands, who today have announced further measures. Until we can vaccinate enough vulnerable people and ensure they get the second dose so that they're protected, we must act to suppress this virus. Our strategy throughout, as set out in the Winter Plan, has been to suppress the virus while protecting the economy, education and the NHS until the vaccine can make us safe. And today, Mr Speaker, I'd like to update the House on the latest steps we're taking on this mission. First, I'd like to update the House on a new development about the virus itself. Over the last few days, thanks to our world-class genomic capability in the UK, we have identified a new variant of coronavirus which may be associated with the faster spread in the southeast of England. Initial analysis suggests that this variant is growing faster than the existing variants. We've currently identified over 1,000 cases with this variant, predominantly in the south of England, although cases have been identified in nearly 60 different local authority areas, and numbers are increasing rapidly. Similar variants have been identified in other countries over the last few months. We've notified the World Health Organization about this new variant, and Public Health England is working hard to continue its expert analysis at Porton Down. Mr Speaker, I must stress at this point that there is currently nothing to suggest that this variant is more likely to cause serious disease, and the latest clinical advice is that it's highly unlikely that this mutation would fail to respond to a vaccine. But it shows we've got to be vigilant and follow the rules and everyone needs to take personal responsibility not to spread this virus. Mr Speaker, the first formal review of tiering decisions is taking place this Wednesday, two weeks after the new rules came into force. However, I need to tell the House that over the last week, we've seen very sharp exponential rises in the virus across London, Kent, parts of Essex and Hertfordshire. We do not know the extent to which this is because of the new variant, but no matter its cause, we have to take swift and decisive action, which unfortunately is absolutely essential to control this deadly disease while the vaccine is rolled out. In some parts of these areas, the doubling time is around every seven days. This isn't just about rising rates among school-aged children anymore, but in all age groups, including the over 60s. And we know from painful experience that more cases lead to more hospitalisations and, sadly, the loss of more of our loved ones. Hospitals across the capital, Essex and Kent, are already under pressure. And we know that this doubling of cases will be mirrored in hospital admissions, and it only takes a few doublings for the NHS to be overwhelmed. Our NHS is straining every sinew to cope with the pressures, as they always do, but if cases continue to double, even they will be overwhelmed. So we must act now to shift the curve, because when the virus is growing exponentially, there is not a moment to spare. We're therefore acting ahead of the formal review date. 
I am very grateful to colleagues at Public Health England, NHS Test and Trace and the Joint Biosecurity Centre, whose surveillance of this virus means that we can act very rapidly when a problem arises. We have therefore decided to move Greater London, the south and west of Essex, which includes Basildon, Brentwood, Harlow, Epping Forest, Castle Point, Rochford, Malden, Braintree and Chelmsford, along with Thurrock and Southend-on-Sea Borough Councils, and the south of Hertfordshire, which means Broxbourne, Hartsmere, Watford and the Three Rivers Local Authority, into Tier 3, which is the very high alert level. This means that people can only see friends and family they don't live with or are in a support bubble with in outdoor public places and, of course, in line with the Rule of Six. Hospitality settings must close except takeaway and delivery, and people should avoid travelling outside their area and reduce the number of journeys they make wherever possible. Now, I know that this is difficult news, and I know that it will mean plans disrupted, and that for businesses affected, it will be a significant blow. But this action is absolutely essential, not just to keep people safe, but because we've seen early action can help prevent more damaging and longer-lasting problems later. Mr Speaker, these restrictions will come into force at midnight on Wednesday morning. Because when the virus moves quickly, we must move quickly too. And we must take the actions that are not necessarily easy, but are effective. We will continue to stand with those who are most impacted through our furlough scheme and support for the self-employed. We have already begun to surge mobile testing into these parts of London, Essex and Kent, and we are extending community testing too. In addition, I can tell the House that this weekend, as part of our expansion of community testing, we are extending it to 67 local authorities across England, and further, today we will be publishing a guide for colleagues to promote, support and champion local community testing and contact tracing. Yeah, yeah. We'll be using millions of newly invented tests to reduce the rate of infection in areas where infection is highest and help to move down through tiers and closer to normal life. Mr Speaker, thanks to the forces of science, help is on its way. But while we know now that that day will come, this isn't over yet. And while we deploy the fruits of scientific endeavour to make the country safe, we must do what it takes to protect our loved ones and our NHS now. I know these steps are hard, but we must not waver as we enter the final stretch, so that when we look back on this time of crisis, we can all say that we played our part. And I commend this statement to the House. We now come to Shadow Secretary of State, Jonathan Ashworth. Grateful, Mr Speaker, and as always, grateful to the State for advance side of his statement. This is a virus that, without adequate restrictions in place, spreads with ferocity. And case rates are increasing again, hospital admissions climbing, the R edging up. Last week, the England-wide rate was 159 per 100,000. Now it's 188 per 100,000. That's a 20% increase. Across London, cases have increased 30%. Across the east of England, 36%. Six percent. So none of us are surprised at the action he is taking today. Indeed, he was warned that Tier 2 wouldn't be enough to con contain the spread of the virus in many places. And indeed, it looks like in some areas, such as Kent, Tier 3 isn't enough to contain the spread either. Elsewhere in the country, Tier 3 does appear to be uh, um, allowing the virus, to f uh, forcing the virus to flatline, and indeed the North West is trending down. But overall, the increasing areas are rising faster than the decreasing areas are falling. And as things stand, we are heading into the Christmas easing with diminishing headroom. The buffer zone these tiers were supposed to provide is getting much thinner. So what is his plan to keep people safe through Christmas and avoid huge pressures on the NHS in January? What is his plan to support an exhausted, underfunded, understaffed NHS through January to deliver the care patients will need? And is he confident that our NHS won't be so overwhelmed in January that it impacts the vaccination programme? Now, our response throughout to COVID could have been stronger had contact tracing been more effective. In boroughs like Islington, only 65% traced by the national system. In Tower Hamlets, only 60%. In Barking, 61%. And yet, test and trace is costing £22 billion, more than the policing and fire service budgets combined. And yet, according to the NAO, up to September, only £785 million was allocated to local council public health 
teams. Meanwhile, Serco have subcontracted to 21 other firms, offering little training to staff, with some in call centres, alongside others making sales calls for gambling websites. Surely it's time to scrap Serco and put all public health teams in the lead in doing the retrospective cluster-busting contact tracing we need. Now, he has promised more testing for Tier 3 areas. What about the Tier 2 areas? And on the lateral flow tests he is rolling out, he will know that some care home providers are refusing to use these because they're concerned about their accuracy. So is he satis satisfied that these tests are accurate enough for this purpose and are safe? And if they can't be used for care homes, how quickly can care home residents' relatives make use of PCR tests? Now, he often praises Liverpool, but isn't the biggest lesson to draw from Liverpool that people still struggle to isolate if they haven't got the financial means to do so? The eligibility criteria for the £500 payment is still too tightly drawn. People need decent sick pay. People in some circumstances need alternative accommodation. People need help with the shopping and the medicines. Surely some of the £22 billion spent on tests and trace could be reallocated to offer people adequate isolation support. Now, on the variant that has been identified, our constituents will be naturally concerned. Will he undertake to keep that House updated throughout? Uh, and I'm grateful for the briefings that he has arranged for myself and others with the Chief Medical Officer. But if this variation means the virus is, is more easily transmissible, then fixing contact tracing and isolation becomes even more fiercely urgent. Now, finally, Mr Speaker, today I spoke to Fred Banning. Fred is just 38. He has two children under 10, and he has terminal cancer. He asks that those with terminal illness are given quicker access to the vaccine. So, so he can, in the words that he said to me this morning, make the most of the time he has left with his family. I understand these are clinical decisions, but could he, through his offices, look into access to the vaccine for those with terminal illness and see what can be done for people like Fred and many others in this situation? Secretary of State. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Well, I'm glad to say that across large parts of uh, the country, there is very good evidence <laughs> that Tier 3 restrictions are working and the rates are coming down. But we do need to be vigilant. And as he knows, overall, uh, rates are no longer coming down, and hence we're having to take further action. And in particular, uh, he talks about the lessons from Liverpool. I think the primary lesson from Liverpool is that when everybody pulls together and everybody makes the sacrifices that are necessary for their whole community, you can really get this thing under control. And I'm grateful to colleagues across London and Essex and Hertfordshire uh, who I've been talking to today who are committed to working to ensure that we get the public health messages out first and foremost. Um, and to the mayor and his, uh, uh, the Conservative candidate for mayor um, to, who are all committed to working on behalf of the capital and, of course, those parts of Essex and Kent and uh, Hertfordshire that are affected, because the single best thing that we can all do is speak with one voice about what's needed to get this under control. Uh, he asks about Christmas, and my recommendation to people at Christmas is to be cautious and careful. Uh, he asks about NHS funding and staffing. Of course, we have the uh, strongest funding in history for the NHS, and I'm delighted to say that we have more nurses in the NHS than ever before. 14,000 more nurses uh, than this time last year, and I pay tribute to each and every one of them. Uh, he asks about contact tracing, and no doubt he will have seen the figures published on Thursday, which show, show that contact tracing now reaches over 80% of contacts, and I pay tribute to the team, uh, both local and national, who are ensuring that we can, we can get to more than four-fifths of people who we need to reach, uh, and that has been rapidly improving. Um, and um, he also finally asks about uh, Fred, uh, the gentleman with terminal cancer who he spoke to this morning. What I'd say is that those with terminal cancer, of course, are clinically vulnerable by their nature um, and by the nature of that awful disease. Uh, and we will ensure that those who are clinically vulnerable do get access uh, to the vaccine when it is clinically appropriate. Uh, and I will, uh, I'm very happy to take up the individual case uh, that he raises and ensure that he gets a fair deal. 
Uh, but all, all in all, uh, Mr Speaker, I'm grateful for the Honourable Gentleman's support for the measures that we've outlined today uh, and, of course, support for the vaccine programme, which is rolling out across the country right now. We now come to the Chair of Select Committee, Jeremy Hunt. Thank you, Mr Speaker. These are incredibly difficult decisions, but I wholly support them because the evidence from all over the world is that in these situations, acting early and decisively is the best way to save both lives and jobs. And so close to rolling out the vaccine, it would be perverse in the extreme if we were to take our foot off the pedal. But can I ask him about this new strain, uh, first of all? He said it's highly unlikely that the vaccine won't work with the new strain. When will we know for sure? Are there any trials going on? Is he going to get more up-to-date scientific information on this anytime soon? And secondly, can I ask him for clarity? Just 11 days before Christmas, lots of people will be thinking about Christmas shopping. From Wednesday, if you live outside London, will it be against the regulations to come into Oxford Street to do your Christmas shopping? If you live inside London, will it be against the regulations to do your Christmas shopping? And is the only way to do your Christmas shopping legally now to go online? Thursday. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr Speaker. Um, well, the, uh, firstly, the, his point about the, uh, the new variant, uh, that is being assessed, the question he asked is being assessed in Porton Down right now, but as I said in my statement, the, the medical advice that we have uh, is that there is, it is highly unlikely uh, that this new variant uh, will impinge the vaccine and the impact of the vaccine, but we will know that in the coming uh, days and weeks as the uh, vaccine is, cult uh, as the new uh, strand is cultured at Porton Down uh, and then, of course, the tests conducted upon it. Um, when he, uh, the question he asks about uh, Christmas shopping is important. It is recommended that people should minimise travel unless it's necessary in a Tier 3 area and should minimise travel where it's necessary to a Tier 3 area. Uh, and so we have, we have taken this action to try to protect people and to try to slow the spread of this virus. Uh, and that is absolutely the right thing to do. Let's head up to Scotland to SNP spokesperson Dr Philippa Whitford. Dr Whitford. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Many public health experts have questioned the use of innova lateral flow tests for mass community testing, especially as the manufacturers do not recommend them for detecting coronavirus in people who are asymptomatic. The Secretary of State must be aware of the paper from Liverpool University based on his own department's quality assurance programme, which has raised serious concerns about their accuracy when used in the community testing project in Liverpool. The comparison of lateral flow tests with PCR in over 3,000 people revealed a sensitivity of just 48%, meaning that more than half of those with the virus would be falsely reassured they were negative. The test even missed 30% of those with a high viral load, those most likely to be infectious. I understand the wish to use quick tests for case finding, but surely he should now delay rolling them out to 67 other local authorities and not proceed with plans to spend £43 billion for a test which is so inaccurate. Would it not be better to focus funding on easier and quicker access to PCR tests? With more than half of all positive cases being missed, does he accept that despite the proposal by Baroness Harding, these tests cannot be used to release people who are contacts from isolating? And on the basis of this study, the Liverpool Health Protection Board have abandoned plans to use lateral flow tests to check visitors to care homes. So will he be recommending that local authorities and providers return to PCR testing for care home staff and family visitors to reduce the risk to the most vulnerable residents? Secretary of State. Um, Mr Speaker, I, I think that this uh, argument against testing is wrong. I think that we should test, 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 and that's what we're doing on this side and this government. And we're working very closely with the government in, uh, in Scotland uh, from the same party that she represents to make sure that we use testing as widely as possible to find people who've got this virus. And yes, of course, different tests have different characteristics. 
and the lateral flow tests uh, find around 70% of those who are infectious. And that means that if you test people who wouldn't otherwise have been tested, you find the positive cases, you can get them to isolate, and you can break the chains of transmission. So I would just strongly urge her uh, to go back uh, to study the details and to back the testing programme that we have in this country. Mr Speaker, um, I fully recognise uh, my right honourable friend's serious dilemmas. It's not an enviable position. Uh, but the application of Tier 3 to London raises some questions. Uh, in my borough, I had long conversations with public health and the hospitals, and they maintain the infection rate is almost exclusively now amongst school children and them uh, secondary school children and passing on to their parents, those two least at risk groups. And so the hospitals are not overcrowded with spare beds in the ICUs and also a very low level of COVID patients in the hospitals. The question I ask him, therefore, is Tier 3 will hammer down on the one area that does control what happens, which is in hospitality. And the key area here, surely, is that in doing that, they will shift back to their homes. And it is that area where we would worry about with off licenses selling alcohol late in the evening. Can he try and seek some kind of flexibility within this so it targets better the real risk and doesn't just hammer those that have been doing the right thing? First, I, we're, always, we're always open to finding uh, new ways that protect the economy as much as possible to bring this virus under control. And I share that my right honourable friend's desire to get this under control and keep it under control until a vaccine can make us safe. But unfortunately, this is no longer just a problem in Waltham Forest and uh, North East London amongst um, school aged children, which it has been until the last uh, week's data. Um, the case rate in, amongst the over 60s in Waltham Forest is now over 250, and we're seeing rising, that rising uh, over the last week, and we're also seeing rising admissions to hospital. So whilst I have a huge amount of sympathy for everybody affected by these decisions in Waltham Forest, it is absolutely essential to get a, this uh, under control now to in, or, in order to protect the NHS from being overwhelmed in the future. And it is the inexorable link from cases now to hospitalisations in the future uh, and sadly uh, to deaths that we must break by using uh, the vaccine and we must bring down by the use of testing. Um, but until uh, we can have that vaccine fully rolled out and people uh, to uh, be, um, uh, be inoculated by having had their second dose, and until enough vulnerable people have had that second dose and therefore been, become inoculated, unfortunately measures like this are necessary. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Health Secretary is fully aware that hundreds of thousands of jobs have been lost during the pandemic, which continues to hit our economy. This means a vast number of families and individuals are diving into hardship. Having no heating and no hot water is what many residents across our country will face this Christmas as they visit food banks. What discussion has he had with the Works and Pension Secretary regarding the rising, the reducing, the rising level of poverty? Um, uh, Mr Speaker, we're trying to uh, support the economy as much as possible uh, through all these difficult uh, decisions, um, and the extraordinary levels of financial support are part of that, including the furlough scheme uh, now extended to, uh, the, uh, to, to the end of March. Um, and um, I, I, of course, I talk to my uh, colleague, the Work and Pension Secretary, uh, regularly to make sure that we take the action that's necessary in the way that supports people as much as possible. We now come to Sir Bernard Jack. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, may I thank my right honourable friend for his statement, albeit that it contains a lot of very grim news about the virus itself and about the effect on many areas, though it will be greeted with considerable relief in Harwich and Clacton and Colchester and Uttlesford, uh, where the virus rates are much lower and we'll stay in Tier 2. But isn't the message now uh, that uh, we stay in Tier 2 or go down a tier much more by our own efforts, by the efforts of local authorities with the support of NHS Test and Trace, uh, to make sure that we support those who have to isolate, that we track down and trace the, those who are spreading the virus, because by doing this and by compliance and forbearance, we can reduce the spread of the virus and we can help defeat it so that we can get down the tiers. 
Uh, yeah, so. Yes, Mr Speaker, my, my right honourable friend is absolutely right that it is in the hands of local authorities and local communities uh, to try to keep this virus under control. And I'd say to everybody in, in Harwich and people across uh, the southeast and the east of England who haven't gone into Tier 3 today that we all still need to work together and be vigilant and effectively do everything we can to stop the spread of the disease because so many people are asymptomatic, about a third of people are asymptomatic, never have any symptoms, but can nevertheless spread the disease. I'm, I'm very grateful to my right honourable friend for the work that he's done in um, giving me ideas to bring forward this uh, pack to support uh, colleagues to help in this effort, because the links between the national system and the local authorities are getting stronger all the time, and I want colleagues also to be able to play our, our part, as, especially as, as those of us who... You know, who, through our campaigning, know our communities well, to get into communities to spread the message that if we all stick by the rules and if we get the testing in and the contact tracing in, then we'll be able to keep this under control. Let's head to Devon with Ben Bradshaw. Ben Bradshaw. Uh, with cases in Devon uh, down to 71 per 100,000 and falling, and COVID hospital emissions also falling, will the only reason that Devon doesn't go into Tier 1 this week be because of the shortage of staff and hospital capacity after 10 years of Conservative government cuts? Secretary of State. Uh, no, Mr Speaker. Firstly, um, the, there is, uh, there's a record number of uh, NHS staff, thanks to this Conservative <laughs> government, in, and uh, there is a record number of, uh, there's a record number of nurses, 14,000 more nurses. Um, but what I do, what I would say, also is that to people in Devon, currently in Tier 2, but with low rates, don't take it for granted. Let's all work together and try to get Devon into Tier 1. Uh, and I, in Exeter, uh, those rates have come down really sharply in the last few weeks. Let's keep working at it. And let's keep those public health messages going, not only with relation to coronavirus, but also with relation to the importance of eating fruit. Right, we've got eight with John Shaw, Manira Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know where to go if we run out of fruit now. <laughs> my, um, my children are desperate to see their grandparents this Christmas, as is the case for many families up and down the country. But in view of these alarming numbers, and with what we're seeing in the US following Thanksgiving, and with the constant chopping and changing of rules, which leads to lower compliance and more confusion. I appreciate the Secretary of State doesn't want to be the Grinch, but should he be reconsidering uh, the Christmas measures that are in place, or do we risk unnecessary additional deaths in the new yeah. year, just as we've got light at the end of the tunnel with the vaccine? So state. Well, I would recommend to people to exercise caution over Christmas, especially with respect to seeing elderly uh, relatives, who, of course, people are yearning to see. I understand that. Uh, but I think it is important that people not only abide by the rules, but also take personal responsibility in case they have coronavirus, might be passing it on, but don't have any symptoms and don't know about it. But sent to S6 with Robert Halfon. Robert Halfon. Uh, my right honourable friend will know I've supported the measures, all the measures that have been put in place, and I've put my faith in the government and the scientists and medical officers. However, I have real worries about Harlow and Essex being put into Tier 3, as local hospitality businesses are really struggling and on their knees. I'd be grateful if my right honourable friend could explain how further restrictions will curb the disease, given that cases increased in Harlow during the second national lockdown. I understand that the virus recently stabilised in Harlow and there have been no rates of increase in the over 60s in the last week. Further to this, the overall increase in cases in Harlow is 12% against a regional average of 40%. So I ask my right on friend to consider keeping Harlow in Tier 2. Uh, thank you very much, Mr Speaker. Well, unfortunately, cases are rising in Harlow and in the uh, districts of uh, Essex and Hertfordshire nearby, and so we uh, do have to take the action that we do. What I'd say to my right honourable friend, who is an uh, incredible champion of Harlow and of his local community, is let's work together to get this down, and let's work together to get this done, and let's work together to try to get Harlow in, back into Tier 2 as soon as possible, not just uh, to, um, uh, to save lives, 
uh, and to protect the NHS in Harlow, uh, but to give people their, their livelihoods back to. Jim. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Secretary of State for his update uh, and keeping us uh, OK with what's happening uh, in relation to COVID. Uh, as a type 2 diabetic, I will take my vaccine when the time comes for me to take it uh, and, and uh, make sure that everybody uh, all gets it before I do. But could the Minister outline the response from the medical community as to the reactions to the vaccination and the safety of these drugs for those who feel, in some cases, that it's been rushed through? On the contrary, uh, Mr Speaker, all of the uh, safety checks that are necessary have been carried out and we continue to monitor uh, the rollout of the vaccine uh, th throughout the UK uh, and the MHRA have done a, a terrific job at doing that and continue to do so. For instance, my team and the MHRA were having an update assessment on Saturday morning uh, to check the progress of the first week's rollout uh, and uh, I'm delighted to say we're able to uh, to keep doing that and, and I, I would just say to him and to everybody else who wants to see the impact of the vaccine uh, look at the faces of those who've had their first dose and how pleased they are uh, to have had it and to be able to get that step closer to protection from this awful disease. Mr. Button. Thank you Mr Speaker. I note that Essex and Hertfordshire have been split into two, partly tier two, partly tier three. However, Greater London has been treated as one. In central London, our cases are significantly below the national average, and whether this House likes it or not, central London is the powerhouse of our national economy. Can my right honourable friend tell me why London has been treated differently from Essex and Hertfordshire? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Mr Speaker, as you know, we look at, in great detail and at granular level at the geographies that these restrictions have to cover. And unfortunately, central London case rates are rising. And we know that if an area is surrounded by other areas where there are significant increases, then those tend to move into an area if it's left out of a set of restrictions. I understand, of course, the impact on the economy. Uh, but the very clear public health advice was that London should move together because all areas of London are seeing an increase in rates and we need to stop that. Let's head up to Greater Manchester with Tony Lloyd. Tony Lloyd. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The, the um, Health Secretary seems to answer rather dogmatically to the Honourable Lady for Central Ayrshire about uh, the, the lateral flow test. Can I say to him that it does seem reasonable that as a diagnostic for people to self-isolate, it uh, it's has validity, but with a very high false negative. Is he seriously recommending this is the first line of defence for people going into our care homes? Because if it is, I think it's a very dangerous proposition on his part. Uh, thank you very much. I, I think um, that there is, it is important that we use the right tests in the right circumstances with the right other uh, uh, conditions. So, for instance, there is very clear visitor guidance of which testing is one part, but PPE is another critical part. And so the nuanced question that he asks, I think, is an entirely reasonable one. Uh, the thing that I find frustrating is the idea that we should discourage people from coming forward for asymptomatic testing, where the task is to find as many people as possible who have the virus and get them to isolate. Uh, and um, so, yes, we should ensure that visiting to care homes is done as safely as possible, and there are health upsides to visiting, as well as the challenges posed by the virus. But in terms of asymptomatic uh, testing, I would encourage people where it's available to come forward, uh, because that's how we find where this virus is and help to isolate them. That said to Derbyshire with Nigel Mills. Nigel Mills. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I thank the Secretary of State for the rollout of um, lateral flow tests across uh, uh, Derbyshire? When he does his reassessment on Wednesday, would he be willing to look at more localised geography, perhaps based around hospital catchment areas and divide the county of Derbyshire between north and south rather than use the whole county, which is not a very functional geography on the ground? We're happy to look at uh, the human geographies, as the, my right hon. friend, the Prime Minister, put it, um, as we have with the decision today uh, to go to take uh, parts of Essex and parts of Hertfordshire uh, into Tier 3, uh, precisely because of those human geographies. And we also look at the travel to work patterns uh, and, the, well, the travelling patterns um, to see where the likelihood of spread is greatest. Uh, and, uh, and, we, and we set out the data on which we take the decision. So I think the answer to my honourable friend is yes. 
Well, you go to Alan Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Contact rates in Scotland led by public health uh, professionals and achieved contact rates up to 95 per cent. Down here, as we know, it is uh, handed out to privatised companies like CERCO. Now, CERCO has got a 400 million contract that they then subcontracted to 21 further companies. What assurances does it have that there is sufficient coordination across these 21 companies and CERCO and that everything is under control rather than at further layers of complexity? Uh, the good news is that the, uh, the contact tracing across uh, England is increasing in its, uh, in its capacity, uh, it's getting uh, faster and it's finding more and more uh, contacts. And the comparison of apples and pears, which continues to come from the, uh, from the front bench over there, uh, where they don't take into account that if you, if you contact trace in a care home, the contact tracing is much easier. And if you include that contact tracing in the data, you do get different answers. Um, so I'm, I, I think this obsession, this obsession with how um, the public sector good, private sector bad, is really, is really, I mean, we've had it for months. And it's, and it's just as wrong now as it was six months ago. Right, let's head to Rutland with Alicia Kearns. Alicia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Today's news is deeply sombre, so I ask my right honourable friend to join me in urging residents of Rutland and Melton to be vigilant because we are also seeing cases rising locally, even in our villages. We have to get rates under control if we're to be decoupled from Leicester City, remain at most in Tier 2 in Rutland and protect ourselves from this new variant. But will he join me in thanking those who are working so hard locally to ready our vaccine hubs in Oak and Melton for once the vaccine is ready for delivery outside of hospitals? Uh, yes, of course, absolutely. I'm delighted at the, uh, that we're now uh, vaccinating from um, over a hundred different community settings, as well as uh, 70 hospitals across the UK. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a tribute to the whole vaccine rollout team, who've done a magnificent job over the last, uh, uh, well, I was going to say over the last week that it's been rolling out, but it's been weeks and weeks in the planning uh, before then. What I'd say to residents in, Me in Melton and in Rutland, we will look at Leicester, Leicestershire and Rutland uh, separately when we make the decision on tiering on uh, Wednesday. Those in Rutland who are in Tier 2 still need to work at it and do their bit to try to keep Rutland in Tier 2 and, of course, hopefully get to Tier 1. It's so important that everybody does their bit. Stephen Dwight. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Secretary has rightly set out a very stark picture today, um, not only on that variant, but also of the growing pressures and the pressures that are likely to come on our NHS at this critical time. Um, would he therefore agree with me, particularly given the crucial supply chains for the vaccine, uh, of PPE, of the 40 million packages of medicine that go back and forth between ourselves and the EU um, every month, that the talks must continue and that we must not end up in a no-deal outcome, which would be absolutely devastating at the most critical time for our NHS and our country. Uh, well, the Prime Minister is working hard to, um, uh, to see, that if we, see if we can achieve a deal. I hope that there's movement from the European Union so that we can achieve that, uh, but we are ready for any outcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. And I am obviously very disappointed by the news today that London is going to Tier 3, but having seen the data, having spoken to uh, PHE in London and the hospitals in my constituency, I am fully aware of the threat that this awful virus continues to uh, provide to all of us. And I know that hospitality in particular have done so much to uh, become COVID secure, but yeah. Sadly, we are where we are. And as I, re as I think of our hospitals and the amazing job that our NHS staff are doing day in, day out, night in, night out, and I know the acute hospital trusts in my constituency are handling COVID cases from across London. One of the major concerns that they have raised with me is the length of time that staff must isolate after a positive COVID contact. And I understand that lateral flow testing in hospitals allows staff to return to work safely after five days rather than 14. Mr Speaker, can my right honourable friend confirm that the rollout of the lateral flow tests will be prioritised in hospitals where cases are increasing? Yes, yeah, Dave. Uh, the short answer is, is yes, we are rolling out uh, lateral flow testing uh, to find asymptomatic uh, cases in hospitals um, as uh, 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 right across England, uh, and we're always looking for ways to reduce the burden of isolation 
uh, needed for positive contacts. Um, the, uh, but can I just also pay tribute to my honourable friend's uh, leadership? These are difficult decisions, and it is difficult uh, to explain to people why these measures are necessary, given the, the impact that they have. Uh, but she's quite right to do so, and her analysis of the best way of London coming through this is by presenting a, uh, a, a united front and all of us working together to keep the case rates down. That's how we will best get through this together. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Christmas is often the busiest period for many businesses, particularly in sectors like retail and hospitality, and the uncertainty created with tiering arrangements, chopping and changing at day's notice, has made trading incredibly difficult even for those places currently allowed to stay open. What support will be provided to businesses affected by the tier system in the months ahead to ensure that any closures mandated by his department over this vital trading period do not leave their doors closed permanently? Yes, we want to support businesses as much as we possibly can. Uh, and the support that's available and the record sums is, has been out, outlined by my right hon. Friend, the Chancellor, uh, and that, of course, will be available to businesses as we go into Tier 3. Simon Feld. Mr Speaker, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're delighted to uh, have the first vaccinations rolling out in Furness this week. Um, but what we know is that information is really key to understanding and tackling this virus. So with that in mind, would my right honourable friend give some consideration to uh, adding uh, data on the number of people by cohort who've been vaccinated on the government's yeah. coronavirus website, yeah. Yeah. but also the number of people who've been infected by this new variant of the yeah. virus? Um, on, the, um, on the question of the... Um, uh, the data on the number of vaccinations done. Of course, we will be publishing uh, data on the number of vaccinations, um, and I think that's. Uh, I think that is important. Uh, meanwhile, let's all keep getting out there, making the case uh, that the best way to keep you and your loved ones and your community safe is to get vaccinated when the NHS calls. I said Greater Manchester with Barbara Keeley. Barbara Keeley. Thank you. Self-isolation is crucial to breaking chains of transmission, but too many people cannot afford to self-isolate when asked to do so because of the loss of earnings this will mean. In Salford, only 389 out of 1,760 applications for self-isolation payment have been successful today, meaning many people are not getting the support they need. Will the Secretary of State now agree to providing everyone asked to self-isolate with the financial support which guarantees they won't be worse off because they have done the right thing? Well, the principle that she outlines is exactly the one that we're uh, working to. And uh, the £500 self-isolation payment for those on low incomes is a very important part. And I'm glad that hundreds of people in Salford have been able to reach it. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. May I thank my right honourable friend very much for his statement. I fully understand the difficulties which he faces. He will know that I'm the member for West Dorset. It is a very rural seat. Part of uh, the West is 55 miles away from the commercial centre of Bournemouth, which is the driving force between our tier of our tiering in rural Dorset. We have consistently maintained uh, low numbers of cases, and on Friday we just had one person in our county hospital. Can I ask my right honourable friend that whilst I understand full well he's had to consider the increase of tiering for different places in the United Kingdom today, that he will also, for Wednesday, consider the reduction of tiering to tier one where that is indeed appropriate, as I think Dorset yeah. is. Mr Speaker, I will look at it extremely closely uh, after my uh, honourable friend's uh, entreaty. Uh, and um, I have been noticing that both in West Dorset and in Bournemouth, uh, the number of cases has been coming down. I would say to everybody, uh, stick at it, stick at the rules, and do everything you can to reduce the number of transmissions, uh, and uh, that's the most likely way of, uh, of getting into Tier 1. Thank you, Speaker. It's 12 months since the World Health Organization told us this was a pandemic, and yet multiple schools in Southwark who have had cases of COVID have still had, never had any contact from the government's tracing system, including one college who have had 20 cases since September. In the face of this new faster spreading variant, will he finally fix contact tracing or continue to leave teachers picking up the pieces, having to work weekends, the public to pick up the bill, whilst ministers' mates pick up the multi-million pound contracts that continue, as today shows, continue to let us down? Um, if, he's, if he's got an individual case... Uh, of, uh, of, a, of a school in that situation, uh, then if he could let me know, then we'll uh, sort that out because, the, in general, the links between local directors of public health and the schools 
uh, to tackle these sorts of problems are pretty good. Aaron Bell. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, I know the whole House was thrilled at those wonderful images last week of people receiving the vaccines, including at the Royal Stoke. Um, they, like uh, hospitals across the country, have been gearing up for that moment for months, and it was a really emotional moment for them. Uh, they, like the NHS in general, have got a lot of experience in delivering these vaccine programmes. So can my right honourable friend assure me that we will roll out this vaccine and any others that get approved as quickly as possible, as quickly as manufacturing allows? Yes, that's absolutely the goal. And I pay tribute to everybody at the Royal Stoke. Uh, it, it was wonderful to see some of the examples of those uh, who've been vaccinated. Uh, Stoke is having a rough time is it, uh, of it at, uh, of late. Uh, and we need to make sure we get the, uh, the, va the virus under control, but we also need to get that vaccine rolled out, not just uh, in the city centre, but also in communities right across Stoke and Staffordshire. Let's head over to the member for Huddersfield, Barry Sherman. Barry Sherman. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Um, the Secretary of State will know that I've warmed to his performance over the months of this pandemic, um, and I think he's doing a pretty good job. But could I tell you, I think that it was the Prime Minister that pushed him into the risk relaxation around Christmas. And could I warn him that my local hospitals, Huddersfield and Halifax, are preparing for an awful surge after Christmas at the very wrong time in January, February, when we do not want that kind of pressure. Would he think again and persuade the Prime Minister to think again about any re relaxation of the rules over Christmas to save lives? State. Well, I, I would urge the honourable gentleman uh, to uh, two things. Uh, the first is to, uh, to say to his constituents that we all need to be careful and take personal responsibility to limit the spread over Christmas. Uh, and secondly, just to thank him for the, his kind and generous words. Very bold. Thank you, Mr Speaker. As someone who's always warmly appreciated uh, the energy with which the Secretary of State has tried to prevent uh, our hospitals, has successfully prevented our hospitals being overwhelmed, and has also um, backed uh, this amazing vaccine which is now being rolled out, could I ask the Secretary of State in terms of the capacity in hospitals? I understand that social distancing requires actually fewer beds in hospitals at the moment. And will hospitals be able to add more capacity as the vaccine rollout is, uh, is completed? Um, I, I certainly hope so. Uh, and that's one of the things that we're talking about with the NHS. For now, that isn't possible. Uh, we, of course, have extra emergency capacity in the, in the Nightingales. Um, and the testing regime has actually allowed the NHS to restore many of its services. So for, in places like uh, Worcestershire, for instance, uh, they're able to carry on with almost all of the uh, necessary activity, for instance, the, the electives and the cancer work, uh, even through this uh, second peak. So I pay tribute to uh, the NHS in Worcestershire for the work that they have done uh, with the support of the, uh, the testing uh, regime, and I really hope that the vaccine allows that to, uh, to, to improve again once we've got enough of the vulnerable people, uh, the people who are most vulnerable to this uh, disease vaccinated. Lynn Greenwood. Nottingham Post website is reporting today 72 areas in Tier 2 now have a higher Covid rate than Tier 3 Nottingham. Since we came out of the national lockdown and went into Tier 3, our situation has improved on all five indicators used, but we still don't know whether the improvement is enough to allow us to move down a tier later this week. Will he spell out the thresholds that will be used and will he commit to publishing the rationale for his decision making? Um, yes, the threshold. We have set out uh, what uh, statistics we look at and we publish the statistics. Um, and um, I think Nottinghamshire uh, has done, including Nottingham, have done a very good job in getting their cases down. Jason McCulloch. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. My Colm Valley constituents now follow really closely the local data and they can see that COVID rates are thankfully plummeting in Kirklees, thanks to the local action we've been taking. Can the Secretary of State confirm that he will be using this local data at a granular level later this week to decide whether my area can come out of Tier 3 restrictions? Yes. Let's head up to Scotland to Martin Day. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. 
Uh, a recent report has concluded that some of the poorer countries may not get access to vaccines until 2024. If the ongoing rollout in the Western countries is successful and normality starts to return by spring, will he give his commitment that he will resist calls to declare the pandemic is over and accept that it will remain a global challenge until all countries have widespread vaccination programmes in place? Well, th thanks to the strength of the UK, uh, we have put more funding into the global vaccination effort than any other country in the world. I'm proud of that fact. And of course, uh, we have to work together to ensure vaccines are available everywhere. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Mr Speaker, since the national, uh, the national lockdown, the recent one, began, the infection rate in Leeds has fallen from more than 400 cases per 100,000 to less than 140 today. And the number of COVID patients in hospital has declined by 45% in the last month alone. He will be aware that the city has on balance uh, recommended that Leeds moves from uh, Tier 3 to Tier 2. Businesses have been terribly affected. And I realise he can't give an answer today, but does he accept that having assured areas that where they are placed in the tier system will depend on the efforts they make to get the numbers down, and Leeds has done a great job, that the credibility of that statement needs to be reflected in decisions about where the areas are then put when they show a dramatic reduction. Madam Deputy Speaker, the uh, right hon. Gentleman has made a typically uh, wise uh, intervention ahead of the decision making on Wednesday uh, as to the wider tiering decisions uh, for, uh, for the rest of the country. Now we go to Romsey to Caroline Noakes. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Care Minister has today indicated that there are 12,500 retired GPs and nurses seeking to help with the rollout of the vaccination programme. My constituent David is one of those. He's 67 years old, fit and well, and keen to do his bit. But the system where he has to log on to apply keeps timing him out. I know that my right honourable friend is an absolute whiz with apps. Please, can he make sure that this one works for people like David? Uh, yes, I'm absolutely thrilled at the number of, uh, of, of former clinicians who've come back to support. In fact, when I went to see the vaccine being injected in Milton Keynes, um, I, I met some of them. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll look into the, um, in, into the little whizzing uh, box that is stopping uh, my right honourable friend's constituent from applying. Derek Twig. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, the Secretary of State knows I asked back in April to have mass testing in Holton. So, uh, better late than never go down to the new mass testing centre in the community centre in, in Witness in my constituency this morning and have a, a test which I'm pleased to say uh, was negative but it literally took 10 minutes and had the result back in 30 minutes but my question is to the, to the Secretary of State could he say more about when he expects the uh, vulnerable elderly to have had the second dose of the vaccine? There has to be a 21 day window from the first vaccine to the uh, and so we are aiming to send out invitations so that people can come as close to that 21-day uh, marker as possible. Clinically, the 21 days is a minimum, uh, not a maximum, uh, but the goal is clearly on, the, uh, on or as close to the 21st day as possible. Martin Vickers. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As my right honourable friend is aware, my Cleethorpes constituency is Tier 3, and though there has been a considerable drop in the infection uh, rate, uh, people are still concerned about the rollout of the vaccine. Can you give an, an update and an absolute assurance that uh, my constituency will feature in the rollout uh, in coming weeks? Uh, yes, we're working very hard to get the rollout of the vaccine to every part of the country, including Cleethorpes. And I will look into exactly when uh, the vaccine is arriving in uh, Cleethorpes, and I'll get back to him as soon as possible. And we go to Sheffield to Paul Blomfield. Thank you, uh, Madam Speaker. Now, the Secretary of State is right that at this critical moment, we must think about the NHS staff who we were clapping on the streets so recently, and we clearly must do everything possible to protect people from the spread of the virus. So can I press him to say how the advice for the Christmas period could be strengthened by the government to minimise transmission? And will he recognise the need for better financial support for sectors most affected by the measures that we need, like hospitality, and particularly for those who've fallen through the gaps in the Chancellor's schemes? 
Well, yes, with the decision to move areas to Tier 3 does come extra financial support. And as I've said uh, several times, uh, we do recommend that people exercise personal caution and responsibility over the Christmas period. And now we go to Ashfield to Lee Anderson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The tiered system has worked incredibly well in Ashfield and Eastwood as rates are down due to the hard work and suffering of my constituents. Therefore, could my right honourable friend please reassure me that our hard work, dedication and willingness to do the right thing will be taken into account when deciding on what tier we will be in at the end of the week. My, my honourable friend knows from personal experience the, the, what this disease can be like and he's been such a powerful voice for Ashfield and I'll take his, his, um, his considerations into account when we make a decision on Wednesday. Laura Farris. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. It's extremely concerning that more than a thousand cases of the new variant have been identified in the South East, but I understand that the vaccine still works. The ONS published data today that showed the mortality rate will fall by 84% when all the over 70s are vaccinated. Could my right honourable friend tell the House when he thinks that will be and what it will mean for the tiering system? I would, I would love to be able to answer that question, believe you me. Uh, the, we don't know because it depends on the speed of, ma of manufacture of the vaccines and the um, approval um, or not of the Oxford vaccine by the MHRA. Uh, but the, the, the essence of the way that she asks the question is exactly how we're thinking about it in government. Tobias Elwood. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. Could I echo the uh, request from my Dorset colleague for both Dorset and indeed Bournemouth to be considered to be moved to tier one. The stats uh, actually uh, mark this out and the hospitality industry would be most grateful. Madam Deputy Speaker, 2020 has been the most testing of years. 2021 should be different because of that vaccine. My concern is, is letting down our guard for five days during Christmas could be very dangerous indeed. Could I ask the Secretary of State to review those conditions, which I think were put together some time ago, come back to the House and present an updated version so we don't begin the new year with a third wave? Uh, thank you. I, I take my uh, right honourable friend's uh, views on this very seriously, and I would say to everybody in Bournemouth uh, and across the country uh, that the best way they can help their area come into a, a lower tier uh, is by exercising personal restraint, not see the rules as a uh, as something to push against, but rather to act well within them as much as is possible uh, to ensure that this virus uh, doesn't spread. Daniel Zeichner. The Secretary of State talks a lot about test and trace, but far less about isolate. Uh, the Shadow Secretary of State made important points which I don't think were addressed by the Secretary of State. In my city, a couple of weeks ago, only 14 people had received a £500 payment. The reason people are not is isolating is complicated. But what's gone wrong with the system? It really isn't working, is it? Well, I'm, I'm glad to say that thousands of people are receiving the, uh, the payment. Um, and, of course, it is aimed at the, those on the uh, lowest incomes who need the financial support in order to isolate. Jonathan Gullis. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Yeah. Stoke on Trent has now seen our case rate drop to below 300 per 100,000 and boasts one of the highest testing rates in the West Midlands. Huh? The additional lateral flow tests from the government Adding to the impressive work by Stoke on Trent City Council means we can set tests up to 25,000 people now per week. So, does my right honourable friend agree that community testing will be hugely important in helping areas like Stoke on Trent, North Kidsgrove, and Talk? And can he confirm when mass vaccination sites in the city will appear? Uh, yes, look, Stoke on Trent has had a tough time recently, uh, but the Stoke on Trent City Council and the, con and the community testing that's going on in Stoke on Trent is very impressive. And what all of us as uh, MPs can do is lean into that and to help support the council and the military and others in delivering that, uh, test it, that testing in our communities. And we've set out details of how we can all do that today yeah. so that every single one of us can play our part. Yeah. Andy Slaughter. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can I return to the vaccination of those with terminal illnesses? The wife of one of my constituents, aged 70, with stage four bowel cancer and receiving palliative care, contacted me at the weekend. If his only priority is being 70 and extremely vulnerable, he's in the fourth cohort for vaccination. The terminally ill should be in the first group. 
Will the Secretary of State make that change? And will he give a timescale for each of the nine priority groups for receiving the vaccine? Well, the, the, the Honourable Member asks a, a very sensitive and reasonable question. And, the, and the, of course it's right that we follow the clinical uh, guidance in terms of the order of priority, uh, and we should, which does include those who are clinically uh, extremely vulnerable to this uh, disease. On the timescales, I'm afraid the answer is the same to, answer to him as to my uh, honourable friend, um, which is that we don't know because it depends on the speed at which the manufacturers can produce this uh, vaccine. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Last week, I was absolutely delighted to see the vaccine rolling out across Brecon and Radvershire. I'm hugely grateful to the Vaccine Task Force and the thousands of volunteers who have bravely stepped forward to take yeah, part yeah, in the yeah. trials, including, and I declare an interest at the same time, my dad. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can, my, can my right honourable friend confirm that the vaccine has un undergone months of rigorous trials and that work continues to ensure that other vaccines can be rolled out as quickly, but most importantly, as safely as possible? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. My honourable friend puts it exactly Right, we're working very closely with the Welsh NHS uh, to deliver the vaccine right across uh, Wales. And may I just pay tribute to my honourable friend's father, who continues to play a leadership role in his uh, community by stepping forward for one of the trials. West Street. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Mass testing in schools is something we've repeatedly called for in order to make sure they can open safely. And I welcome the fact the government is rolling out mass testing. But can the government go further to ensure that schools can reopen in January and stay open? And on the vaccine, will he do everything he can, recognising that these decisions are clinically led, to make sure that school staff get access to vaccines as a priority? Well, I understand the, uh, uh, the yearning for a vaccine from school staff. Of course, it has to be clinically led. Uh, the goal is to try to reduce uh, hospitalisations and fatalities from this disease, disease as quickly as possible. And I'm absolutely delighted by the, uh, the community testing rollout to, and the rollout of, of testing to schools in uh, his patch. And I thank him for his, the leadership he's shown locally and encouraging. Catherine Fletcher. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Lancashire's community testing is really starting to ramp up and rapidly increasing. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to, you know, prioritising tier three areas like parts of Lancashire that have been in restrictions since July is really important. Does he agree with me that community engagement and getting a test in these increasingly available community yeah. testing is the thing that gets us all out of tier three in South Ribble, Chorley and West Lancs? Yeah. I totally agree, Madam Deputy Speaker. Do your bit and get a test. Now we go to Scotland, to Peter Grant. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State is very keen to remind us that we all have an individual responsibility to look after not only our own health, but also the health of one another. Every single unnecessary journey into or out of London and the South East increases the risk of the virus being transmitted from one part of the United Kingdom to another. The House of Commons Commission um, I set an example today by asking all House of Commons staff not to attend Parliament unless they absolutely have to. What discussions has the Secretary of State had with his colleague, the Leader of the House, with a view to ensuring that all members of Parliament can take part in all proceedings by video call so that none of us have to make otherwise unnecessary journeys into London with the attendant increased risk of either catching or indeed of spreading the virus among other people? Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Uh, I, I'm afraid the answer to this question is a matter for the House rather than for me as Health Secretary. Yes, indeed. Andrew Bowie. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. <laughs> uh, can I take this opportunity to wish my right honourable friend and the entire ministerial team at the Department for Health a very happy Christmas? I hope that they are able to have some respite over the festive period. I think out of everybody in this place, they have deserved it more than more than uh, anyone. Um, obviously, it's brilliant to see the, the, the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine being uh, rolled out as it is, but, but people are waiting to see the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine come down, not least because it's cheaper, quicker and easier to distribute. Does he have any indication of when that vaccine might be getting approval and coming on stream? 
I'm tempted to try to give an answer to that question, but it is very much a matter for the MHRA. I, I'm very grateful to my, uh, my honourable friend for the good wishes that he sends. Uh, in the department these days, we no longer say at the end of a week, I hope you have a good weekend. We say, I hope you have a weekend. Uh, and likewise, um, I take um, his um, uh, hope that we have a happy Christmas. Uh, frankly, I hope I get a Christmas. Toby Perkins. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Pubs in Tier 2 areas are very heavily regulated environments. In Tier 3, they're completely closed. Nothing like the same restrictions are in place on public transport, in retail shops, in, uh, in care homes, in, and uh, other um, areas where we've seen much more of a spread than, than there is um, within uh, the pubs. So will the Health Secretary consider, rather than just shifting things, areas from Tier 2 to three um, when tier two clearly isn't working actually rethinking his whole approach so that we see the pub sector given the support that it needs to because it actually is a much more regulated much safer environment than many of the areas that the government haven't regulated uh, thank, thank you madam deputy speaker uh, uh, many of the areas many of the uh, facilities that he talks about like care homes are, are are doing unbelievable work to remain covid secure uh, look i understand this the impact of this on hospitality um, and I, I love the uh, hospitality businesses of our country. I love you know, going to pubs. I, we, but unfortunately, we need to tackle this, uh, this virus, and it does mean the necess necessity of some very difficult decisions. Now we go to Essex, to Stephen Metcalf. Uh, thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. As I'm sure my right honourable friend will appreciate, this news will be a bitter blow to people across Basildon and Thorough. Uh, but I accept that case numbers are sadly rising rapidly despite the recent lockdown. Therefore, can you assure me that as we start mass asymptomatic testing in both schools and the community to identify those who are unwittingly carrying the virus, that there will be enough rapid tests available for all those who need and want one? Yes, and I, str I strongly commend my honourable friend's uh, uh, leadership locally. These are tough decisions. But let's get this testing going. Let's get everybody coming forward uh, to get a test if they can. And let's find those cases. Let's ask people then and require them to isolate and then break the chains of transmission and get Essex and Thurrock back out of Tier 3 as soon as we possibly can. Chris Branch. One of my very closest friends, Dan Lass, who I knew for more than 30 years, died of um, leukaemia last Thursday morning. Um, and... Uh, he was in the United States of America, so, um, um, but I want to ask the Secretary of State about um, the cancer recovery plan in this country because, of course, cancer still carries on killing people. There are lots of people who have ended up not presenting this year. I know we've got things going again, even during the second wave, and, and you know, that's an amazing job by all the oncologists and all the doctors, but we have got to make sure that um, we get the clinical trials back up and running again. We've got to be able to save lives, and we've got to make sure that people come into the hospitals to get the treatment that they need, because otherwise there will be more people who've lost people like Dan. Madam Deputy Speaker, he's quite right to raise this issue, and, and my condolences to him and all of the family and friends of uh, his friend, uh, who sadly is no longer with us. Um, I pay tribute to the way the NHS has kept cancer services going during this second peak. It's not been easy, but it has saved lives, uh, and they've worked very hard at it, and we must, must keep that going through the remainder of this until we can get through and beyond. Robbie Moore. Thank you, Madam Deputy yeah. Speaker. And can I thank uh, my honourable friend for the statement today and the tough decisions that he's having to make at the moment. Of course... Um, Tier 3 restrictions on London will be tough, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that most of the north of England have been in these extra restrictions for an enhanced period of time, including my constituency of Keighley and Ilkley. And, of course, this has had a, a detrimental impact on the hospitality sector. So will my right honourable friend consider the possibility of a test and dine scheme so that we can try and get our pubs and restaurants back open as soon as possible? Uh, a test and dine scheme is being uh, piloted. Uh, and um, it's something that we're looking at to see what we can do to support the hospitality industry whilst keeping the virus uh, under control. So I'll report back to him uh, with the results of that pilot and see if we can get it going, Keith. And now we go over to Lewisham to Vicky Foxcroft. 
Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The rollout of the vaccine is welcome news, but there's still a long way to go. Now, public messaging has been poor throughout this crisis, and this is particularly true for disabled and clinically extremely vulnerable people who have frequently received guidance after new restrictions have started. Now, we've all seen the vaccine prioritisation list, and the Health Secretary has been asked several times, but honestly, if he agreed to publish an estimated timetable for the rollout, this would be extremely welcome and it'd allow people to have some faith in the future and be able to plan accordingly. I, I, I wish I could do that, um, but I faithfully can't. What I can do is say the majority of people will be vaccinated in the new year uh, and we're uh, working to make sure that the rollout happens as swiftly as safely is uh, possible. Uh, so I, uh, I understand the yearning, uh, but uh, it, I can't put a date on it. Alex Shelbrook. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, my wonderful friend will know just how hard the people of Leeds have worked, indeed. Um, the comments made by the right honourable gentleman for Leeds Central and my honourable friend for Pudsey, who's in his place, and I would like to also make, put on record our thanks to what the people of Leeds have done. Um, my honourable friend has hinted about what may or may not happen, and I wouldn't want to push him on that. But one thing which I have concern about, which is coming from the hospitality sector, is that if an announcement was made to come from Tier 3 to Tier 2, how quickly would that be enacted? Because if we do come down to Tier 2, the hospitality industry does need time to get moving as quickly as possible for the Christmas business season. My uh, honourable friend makes the case uh, very strongly, not only for... Uh, for him, uh, but also for my uh, honourable friend from Pudsey, who, uh, as a whip, can't speak, uh, but uh, believe you me, behind the scenes makes the case for Pudsey more strongly than anyone makes the case for anywhere uh, in this house, almost. And, um, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 and um, uh, uh, it's a team effort. Uh, and um, uh, uh, the, the, answer, the specific answer to the question is the decision made on Wednesday uh, will be published on Thursday and come into effect uh, in the early hours of Saturday morning. Kevin Jones. Speaker, the announcement of the vaccine was very welcome, uh, but like a lot of things for the government, there's a big difference uh, between what has been promised and spun and what is actually happening on the ground. Uh, I was contacted this morning by... Uh, Mrs. Leslie Rhodes in Chesley Street, my constituency, concerning her mother, uh, Mrs. Gowland, who is resident in the Pick Tree Care Home in Chesley Street, who has been told the vaccine will not be available to them and other care homes in County Durham until into the new year. So, can the Secretary of State tell uh, her and other residents of care homes in County Durham when they will start receiving the vaccine? Um, the, the Honourable Gentleman is quite uh, wrong and we've been very clear on the rollout of the vaccine at the uh, the pace at which we can start it and in fact we started it ahead of when we committed to and also the uncertainties over the timing of the rollout as he'll have seen from my answer to the previous but one question when it comes to the care home rollout i have been absolutely clear that we aim to have the care home rollout started in england before Christmas, and I'm delighted that it has been able to be started in Scotland today. Yeah. Hugh Merriman. Madam Deputy Speaker, evidence seems to suggest that when it comes to face coverings on public transport, that if everyone wears them, then it reduces the spread. But if some people don't, then it can actually increase it because people fiddle around with their face masks and others are spraying out. I don't know if the Secretary of State would agree, but it's been very worrying travelling on trains, seeing you know, what appears to be a marked deterioration in the number of people wearing face masks. Would he send a message out that people really must do better? I know that the masks can slip for everyone, but by and large, people really must follow the rules and ensure that they are not just protecting themselves, but everybody and essential public workers on our public transport system. So I think my honourable friends, uh, what he says is exactly right. Now we go to Scotland again, to Kristen Oswald. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State heard earlier about my constituent, Fred Banning, a 38-year-old father of two who has terminal cancer. For Fred and others in his situation, the vaccine is all about making the best of the time remaining. 
I've written to the chair of the GCVI, Minister for COVID, vac COVID vaccine deployment and the devolved administrations, seeking a review of the priority given to those living with terminal illness. So will the Secretary of State work with them to deliver a speedy response for Mr Banning and others in his tragic circumstances? I, I appreciate the sensitive way in which the Honourable Lady raises this case. Uh, and of course, and I'd be very happy to ensure that this is looked at properly by the JCVI. But of course, the decision, as I'm sure she'll understand, is rightly for them. And now we go to Bromley to Sir Robert. Thank you very much, Madam Deputy Speaker. The Secretary of State has to recognise that the decision in relation to London will have a crippling effect upon the hospitality industry in the capital, not least because this is the time of year when they might most hope goods, the losses that they've already suffered. And because... Robert, for the time being, so we'll... Uh, would the uh, I, half I, the question? I, I've, um, I, I got the gist of it, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, and I, do, I just wanted to say it, that my honourable friend is quite right to raise the concern about the hospitality industry. Um, it is a, of course, this will be a a significant blow to the hospitality industry uh, and we only take this action because it is absolutely necessary because the rates of increase of this virus uh, right across London and, uh, and especially in, uh, in Kent and, um, uh, uh, and therefore it is necessary and the best thing we can do is all work together to try to get London out of tier three. William Rack. Thank you. Oh, I... <laughs> I do beg the Honourable Gentleman's pardon and for confusing the Secretary of State. We are actually going to Calder Valley to Mr Craig Whitaker. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Will my right honourable friend join me in thanking all those local authorities like Calderdale who've already come forward to put in place community testing? And can he assure me that central government will stand squarely behind local areas which are doing everything they can do to move to lower restrictions and hopefully for Calderdale later on in the week. Well, he makes his case, as other West Yorkshire colleagues have uh, today. Uh, the, the rollout of uh, mass community testing in Calderdale has been impressive. There's lots more work to do. And my message, as I'm sure uh, he would reiterate, is uh, let's get tested. Let's get this virus under control in, in West Yorkshire. And now, William Rank. Thank you, thank you very much indeed for that warm welcome. Um, but further to the further to the question uh, from my honourable friend, the member for Harwich and North Essex, the approach uh, with Essex and Hertfordshire shows that district authorities can be dealt with separately uh, between tiers. So, with that tantalising prospect, will my right honourable friend commit to looking? closely at the very encouraging data from Stockport and indeed other boroughs in Greater Manchester when reviewing those tiers this Thursday. I, I can absolutely give that commitment and say to the people of Stockport, they've been in restrictions for a long time. Uh, they've done a great thing bringing the case rate right down. Of course we've got to remain vigilant and today's news only uh, further amplifies that fact. Uh, but by doing the right thing, uh, they, have, uh, they have helped to protect life, uh, and I'll look very closely at their case on Wednesday. Karen Buck. Oh, Dr. Speaker, um, people want to spend the Christmas holiday with their loved ones. Of course they do. And the message of doing so with care is one that we need to all uh, stress. But given the very worrying statistics that we've heard uh, today, can the Secretary of State tell us if he has asked for or received any modelling as to what the impact of the suspension of, uh, of restrictions over the Christmas holiday and the movement of people all around the country are likely to mean for the spread of infections and for the hospitalisation rates in the middle of January? Well, the, the truth is it all depends on how people behave and it's so important that we all urge people to behave with great care and responsibility over the Christmas period. Nasrat Ghani. 
yeah, the deputy yeah, yeah. speaker. Yeah. I congratulate my, my right honourable friend for the fantastic work he's done for the vaccine. Can I please urge him, on behalf of my constituents in Wildon, who I met, who I spoke to this weekend, they're going to struggle to get to some of the hospitals which are over an hour away. So can he do all he can to make sure the vaccine comes into my rural constituency? And the other bit of good news is my right honourable friend saying at the dispatch box that the tears will no longer be at county level. My Wilden residents have gone above and beyond to keep infection rates down. Can they not pay the price for what is happening outside of Wilden? Can we ensure that their tears remain the same or is reduced? Now, I'll take a look at uh, the numbers in the Wilden in particular. I, I am concerned around uh, the, uh, the rate of increase in other parts of the South East, and we'll have to look very carefully at that, at that case. Um, on the vaccine rollout, of course we want the vaccine in all communities across the country. I'm delighted that today we managed to start the, uh, the GP rollout, which means that over 100 different communities have been able to get uh, vaccine um, out of the major centres and the major hospitals and into local uh, communities. And I'll check where Wealdon is on the list to make sure everybody in Wealdon can get their vaccine at their appropriate turn. And now we go to Newcastle to Chion Wara. Um, thank you, uh, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, the, I hope the Secretary of State recognises the sacrifices Geordies have made to successfully reduce transmission rates here, but I want to ask about vaccine prioritisation. So Public Health England reported that those with learning disabilities have COVID-19 death rates up to six times higher than the general population, and it's obviously extremely difficult to maintain COVID security in care homes whose residents cannot understand social distancing. Yet I'm told that they're being deprioritised for the vaccine because JCVI guidelines prioritise care homes for the elderly only, and that is interpreted as being over 80. Can he confirm whether that is the case, and can he give greater flexibility to local public health authorities to reflect risk? Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, nobody has been deprioritised. The, the, the nation has been prioritised according to clinical need, and that's rightly a judgment for the JCVI. They have, of course, looked into the research and the data that the Honourable Lady rightly raises uh, and come to the view that the level of risk uh, for those who are clinically extremely vulnerable is akin to the level of risk for uh, those who are 70, years, 70 to 75 years of age, and that's why they've taken the uh, prioritisation decision that they have. Emma Lewell-Mock. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Despite all the sacrifices we have made in South Shields, we are in the top 50 coronavirus hotspots. But that's not surprising since centralised contact tracing is failing us. Just today, it's been revealed that contact tracing companies subcontracted by CERCO are using inexperienced and unqualified people to gather vital clinical information. Will he publish a list of these companies and instead allow my local public health experts to take control of the situation? Well, um, local public health experts are already working with the national system. And if I could just gently say that the best way that we can get the case rate down in South Shields is instead of trying to divide people with this public-private split that they seem desperate to do on the other side, let's all get on the same page with the public health messaging. And if for every time she asks me a question about Serco, she asks me a question about how we can work together to keep people alive and safe in South Tyneside and South Shields, we'd be in a better place. Jacob Young. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Can the Secretary of State confirm that London is going into Tier 3 because it is failing on the five tests set out on tiering, and also confirm that Redcoe in Cleveland has considerably improved since the Tier 3 decision was taken across all five tests? Madam Deputy Speaker, the Secretary of State can make my wish come true, because all I want for Christmas is Tier 2. Yeah. <laughs> um, Madam Deputy Speaker... How can I reject an entreaties like that? Uh, it's a, um, I, I, my, my honourable friend makes a very, um, a, a very seasonal uh, claim uh, and uh, request, and we'll be, we'll be, uh, we'll be, we'll be, we'll be very, we'll be looking at it very, very closely come Wednesday uh, and see what's in Santa's bag. Zara Sultana. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was really proud to see that it was Coventry's NHS staff who administered the first vaccinations in the country. But they have been let down by the government 
They were promised free parking throughout the pandemic, only for charges to be reintroduced in June and also at many other hospitals across the country. Only after I handed in a petition, wrote to the Prime Minister and secured a Westminster Hall debate was free parking reinstated for permit holders at Coventry's hospital, but it is still denied to staff without permits. So will the government live up to its promise and pro provide NHS Trust with the funding for free parking for all of their staff? I, I'll just answer the first bit, Madam Deputy Speaker. I was absolutely thrilled to see Coventry delivering the first vaccination of a clinically approved vaccine in the world. It made my heart sing, and I'm so glad that we managed to do that with the help of the international scientists, uh, with the help of the NHS, uh, with the help of the regulator. We made such progress, and it really put Coventry on the map, and I hope that the Honourable Lady is proud. And finally, Siobhan Bailey. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. Um, just while I'm on my feet, I would ask the Health Secretary to um, give thanks to uh, Stroud and Gloucestershire Health and Care teams um, who are working to the point of exhaustion. And this second wave is proving quite difficult in a number of, a number of ways. Um, but separately, um, I welcome the developments in testing and vaccines. And I'd ask um, that whether the Secretary of State will be willing to uh, get PHE to develop more pilots um, and work into roadmaps for sectors like the wedding industry and other struggling sectors so that we can benefit from that as quickly as possible in the new year. Well, the best thing we can do for the wedding industry is try to get this vaccine rolled out as fast as possible to protect people so that this virus no longer kills uh, so many uh, as sadly it does uh, today. Um, and I would just I, I would join my honourable friend in paying tribute to all those in Gloucestershire, in, including in South Gloucestershire, uh, who are working so hard. There, there has been a very difficult spike in the virus. Thankfully, that is coming down now, and I hope to see the hospital numbers reducing in her area. But, of course, as, as that is happening, so we've got to get on with the rollout of the vaccine, which is a 24-7 job, and I pay tribute to and thank all of the NHS staff who are working so hard to make that happen. Thank you. I'm going to suspend the House for three minutes in order to allow colleagues to leave safely and those who are coming in for the next fixture to attend safely. Order.